And we're recording. The story so far. So far, we've talked about the empathise stage of design thinking. We've talked about getting out of the office, getting amongst our users, interviewing them, observing them, doing contextual inquiries, focus groups, various different ways of finding out about our users, their work, their culture, uh, what problems they face, all sorts of interesting information. Um, but we might now be in the position where we've got kind of lots of lots of data. We've talked to lots of people. We've heard lots of things. We've, we've got lots of different views on stuff. And maybe we've got a whole bunch of different observations, but it's it, it's not very well organized. It's um, it's, we, we kind of might feel like we'd need to be some kind of magic octopus to, to keep a hold of all of these different things in our heads and make some kind of sense of it. So what I'd like to talk about today is the define stage of design thinking, uh, where, where we take all of this data that we've got and we try to discover from this data what are the user's real underlying needs, or at least what do we conclude are the user's real underlying needs from the data. We may well find out later on that we're wrong and need to refine it when we take our prototypes back out to users, but, but how can we at least come up with some kind of a hypothesis? So the problem, we've got lots of qualitative data, it feels disorganized, it feels arbitrary, maybe not all of it's written down anywhere, maybe there's things that we have never even written down, uh, it's just in a recorded conversation. And we need to turn this into articulable theories about the users, who are we building this for, what's the value it brings them, what are the contexts they'll use it in, what are the constraints or priorities on how it should work. Now I'm going to talk about quite a few different ways we can go about this, some of them more theoretical, some of them more academic, some of them uh, more practical and things that come out of, uh, from the technology development industry. The thing I would like you to remember is that as a designer you're looking for insight and you're looking for insights that are kind of relevant to your purpose. Uh, the research is just how you're going to get this. Um, so you'll discover as we, t as we talk that some of the techniques will seem quite academic, quite deep, and quite detailed. And generally, the more detailed they are, the more specialised the circumstances in which you'd actually be applying that. So you'll go into an awful lot more detail if you're dealing with something that is safety critical than that if, if you're dealing with something that is, you know, a consumer application that you could put up on the web and make, well, if you get it wrong, maybe you can change it next week. Um, so the place I thought I would start is in dealing with recordings. Suppose that we have gone out and we have interviewed lots of different users, we've done some observations, we've done some focus groups, we've done some contextual inquiries, and we had a recording device with us while we did this, a, a, a video recorder, an audio recorder, or maybe even just, you know, we, we, we've taken the transcript of something, we've got some text. Well, that data is kind of a continuous stream. What I want to suggest is that we're likely to want to extract some discrete items uh, from it because, you know, if we've got a video, how do we get what we want out of a video? We'd rather like to mine down into what were the interesting events in that video? What were the things that people talked about in that video? What were the things that people did? And this is a process, um, well, at least one of the techniques for doing this is called coding, but it's not like coding, programming a computer. Um, it's about applying particular codes like the, as tags to particular events in the recording. Um, so you, you could think of it as tagging, but, um, but generally in, in psychology, social sciences, etc., where they, where they, where they uh, use this technique quite a lot, it gets referred to as coding. And the first stage is being open coding, which we'll see a bit later. So for example, tagging when the user made a mistake or when did the interviewee talk about a particular topic? Well, this bit looks like it's about assessment. So we're going to give it the code assessment. Um, but there, there, there could be loads of other, uh, of other situations. So for example, you might want to tag every time a user got frustrated or every time a user expressed a particular common concern. I think we're being too bureaucratic about this. And another one says, well, I just feel as though there's too many rules around the place. Maybe you'd give both of those um, the same tag. Um, 
there's a set of tools that you that you can generally get access to. Um, so one of them uh, that UNE has a site license for, and I'll show in a bit, is called Envivo. Uh, another one, uh, when I knew the development team working on it, it was called Open Chapter. It's it's changed its name, um, but there's a whole bunch of different uh, tools that will let you put tags straight against sections of a video recording or an audio recording. Or you can also produce transcripts. Uh, you know, you've got some some video, some audio. Um, you can there's typically transcription services where you can basically send it off and say, look, just transcribe this for me for a small fee and get it back, and then you can mark up sections of the text and tag it in particular ways. One of the threats to reliability with doing this is uh, someone could say, okay, you've tagged that as being about bureaucracy, but I don't believe you. I think that was just your interpretation and I think you're misunderstanding it. So how do we demonstrate or at least come up with some kind of evidence um, that this isn't all just um, our own mis misinterpretation of what's going on? Uh, one of the common techniques for doing this is you get uh, more than one person to do the coding, the tagging. And then you can see, well, did they put the same tags on the same items? Did they code it the same way? And so you can come up with a, a, a measure that's called an inter-rater reliability measure uh, to reassure yourself that it, 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 it's not just your quirky interpretation. And if you're doing research and wanting to publish research papers, that might be something that's quite important to do if you're doing design work for a company, well, I guess it depends. It depends on how much the company trusts you just to tag it right in the first place, uh, trust your interpretation. Um, but, but so the, but that might be something that is kind of more important on, on, on the academic research side. So this is a screenshot of Data View, formerly called Open Shappa. And we can see in the top left, there's the video recording that's being tagged. And in this case, uh, I'm not quite sure what this the, this particular video um, is of, but perhaps it's a researcher, uh, you know, playing a game, tea parties or something with a small child, and they are tagging um, various things about uh, what, what what the child does. Uh, perhaps there's some kind of t uh, child development uh, psychology study. Um, but so the, in the spreadsheet, there's kind of parallel uh, streams of particular tags because. Um, you know, you, you may have a situation where you've got overlapping tags. You're wanting to tag what, uh, say, what the parent does, and you're wanting to tag what the child is doing, but maybe they're doing things at the same time. So maybe those tags overlap each other within the video. Um, down the bottom, you've then kind of, you've got the, the, the uh, you know, video player controls that, uh, that, that lets you, well, add in tags, but also jump around the video and, and see what you're doing. This is a screenshot of Envivo. This is commercial software, but UNE does have a site license for it um, that also lets you put tags into video and uh, synchronize it with a transcript. And uh, we can see here, you know, the video in the top left, this is, um, I've actually seen this one. This is the sample video that comes with uh, Envivo. And uh, it's of an interview of, uh, of a couple, and they talk about all sorts of things that you can tag in the video. But you also, for instance, might want to tag things about the turn taking uh, of the participants and, uh, you know, who, who spoke when and how, how it transitioned between them. Lots of interesting things that you could find out about uh, in terms of understanding what these people were talking about, how this conversation went. But... We're technology designers. We're not just social science uh, research. Well, I say just. We're, we're not social science researchers or psychology researchers. We have a particular interest. So the chances are the things that we're going to want to tag are likely to be focused around things we want to discover about how people work. So um, on the occasion that I was doing the observations of students doing maths on the board because I wanted to do uh, an intelligent maths tutor that could help students work through these things, um, perhaps I would have been tagging um, the bits where there were, you know, an unexpected solution. That might have been one of my codes. And then uh, perhaps another code would have been for the um, you know, category of codes for the tutor's response to those unexpected solutions. As it happened, I didn't end up doing that. Um, as it happened, I found that uh, just as I was watching the events, um, I was memorizing instead. I was com coming up with little insights and I was writing them down as I go. 
and I suspect as a designer you'll find that that is something that you want to do quite often. This, this memorization is going to come up a little bit later and it is a proper thing for you to do. Um, the rule of thumb is that the data will still be, if it's recorded, the data is still going to be there tomorrow. Um, but the, th the observation that you've made that is in your head, that needs writing down because tomorrow you might have forgotten it. Um, what can we do with the codes? Well, we could, um, you know, we could do some kind of light analysis on the code. We could notice that, well, when we tagged all of these kind of mistakes, they all happened in this bit of the software and that bit of the software is the problem. Uh, we could all, we could tag situations that, you know, almost all of the users who didn't do this for whom that tag doesn't appear early on they then got into trouble with this other particular tag later on uh, so this can be quite useful for for drawing um drawing even quite high level insights about how our users behave now i talked about the interator reliability measure and i'm actually going to show the equation for one of them because it's relatively simple so this is called cohen's kappa and this is for where you've got two people coding the same um, the same transcript with mutually exclusive codes. So, you know, so um, uh, by which I mean that um, it's not like one of them's tagged it as agree and another of them's tagged it as strongly agree. Uh, maybe you've you know tag tagged this bit as being positive sentiment and this bit as being negative sentiment, and it's it's going to be one or the other. It's not going to be both at the same time. Um, this formula is it's relatively straightforward and explainable and the essentially you, you say well what is the proportion of the time that they agreed and what is the proportion of time that they would have agreed if they'd just been picking codes at random and so that what would two random coders how much would they tend to agree becomes your PE and so PO how much did they agree minus how much randomly would they uh, would they have agreed divided by 1 minus how much randomly would they have uh, agreed. And so that then gives you kind of a scale of 0 to 1, where 0 is it looks like this coding was all random, and 1 being they are in complete agreement about what these codes are. And there, there's rules of thumb over um, how much agreement is necessary. And uh, I believe one of the rules of thumb is, is that if Cohen's kappa is above 0.7, you've done a pretty good job of the coding. Um, but that only really works for two raters, and it, it, it has some particular assumptions behind it. If you've got a more complicated situation, there's a, another equation called Fleiss's kappa, uh, which is rather more complicated, and I'm not going to show on the slide, but nonetheless is available in many of the statistics packages that you might use for qualitative data analysis. Now, we've talked about tagging particular things, and one of the one of the things that we, that I find uh, quite often we care about is groups of stuff and so I would like to draw a relationship between this and the card sorting exercises from earlier by which I mean earlier uh, early, like, when we were talking about empathize we talked about this card sorting exercise where you could give a whole bunch of people here's a bunch of different cards and you could ask them to sort them into groups and you could then come up with the, the table of co-occurrences uh, or the table of how often were these things in particular categories. The co-occurrence one especially uh, we can do for tags. How often do does this user have this tag happen and that tag happen? How often do they talk about this topic and that topic? And if everyone talks about those two topics together, maybe those two topics are related somehow. Um, so from the codes, we could start to extract some kind of, um, I guess, relationship between the codes, some, some kind of groups. And the example I'm going to show on the next slide, this is from a piece of software called Discursus, uh, which does this for conversations. Um, so what you have is every utterance in the conversation gets tagged by various means, which we won't go into, with a topic, what it was about. And so the question here is, these two utterances in the conversation, how much were they about the same topics? Were, how similar were the, the, were the topic tags uh, attached to each of those utterances? And so you've got kind of the conversation laid out both horizontally and vertically, and the relationship between them um, um, uh, is shown in this kind of triangular diagram. 
And then from this, you can kind of spot particular groups where it turns out, well, this section of the conversation was kind of a bit of a contiguous block where they talked about this stuff. And then later on, it turns out that that stuff all crops up again. This this later section ends up being related to that earlier section. Uh, and, and so there, there's that thing turning up, the repeated topics. And so we can do kind of some sorts of automated clustering uh, uh, sorry, automatic, uh, automated kind of group finding in this way, but you can also do it manually with these kind, of, with uh, these sorts of co-occurrence uh, diagrams. You can just kind of spot visually this stuff looks like it goes together.